Hello, and welcome back to the Growth Circle podcast. I'm your host, Lincoln Amstutz, and today I've got Jason Jarrell on the podcast. Very excited to have him here with us. And before I bring him on, a little bit about Jason. Uh, Jason began his career getting his doctorate in physical therapy. He was capable in that position, but it didn't feel like it was the place he wanted to be. He started seriously flipping furniture, dropped out of the program once there proved to be a consistent flow of income. Fast forward to today, Jason has two furniture stores that are fully run by his crew, and he is now out of the day-to-day operations. And Jason's most recent venture is stepping into full-time real estate investing. So without further ado, Jason, welcome to the Growth Circle Podcast. We got it. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for the warm intro. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Glad we can uh, can get into it here. Uh, right off the bat, uh, you've got an impressive and unique story of dropping out of your study program to go into full-time furniture flipping, eventually making that a fully self-sustainable business. Uh, I want to dive into the inner workings there of the company as well as hear about what you've got going on with real estate. But uh, take us back to what sparked that first deal and what w- were, what was your thought process when you cleared that initial profit? Yeah, so I mean... I didn't realize I had a love for business until, you know, I was a few years into kind of trying to flip a handful of different things. The first thing I started flipping was wood slices. We got a farm back home and I had access to a lot of trees. My sister had a wedding and instead of paying, you know, the premium premium price for those wood slices on table toppers, we're like, hey, we got chainsaws, let's cut them up. And so I ended up cutting an extra like 400 slices and I was like, I'm going to see if these will sell on Facebook. And so I started doing all these custom orders and picking up firewood for free and cutting them in my front yard in Springfield. And you know, I was, you know, I'd work for a few hours and, you know, piss off all my neighbors and, you know, it was great, you know, but, you know, doing manual labor and making $180 is a lot different than uh, selling one product and, you know, getting that lump sum. And so after many hours with a chainsaw in my front yard, I was like, I'd like to just try to do one thing. And I, I picked up, I got on Facebook. I was like, I'm just going to see if anything's free. And uh, the first thing I saw was this, it was a brown slate couch, pretty ugly. Got it for free, and I listed it for forty dollars. And looking back, like it was so underlisted, it sold in like fifteen minutes. And I was like, "This is crazy," because I've got a truck, I can charge for delivery. You know, it kind of list goes on, and you know, it all began in a single car garage, and uh, ended up scaling it from there. And you know, once I was, you know, competing for an asset that no one was competing for, I was quickly able to fill up a single car garage, and then. You know, I ended up uh, having the opportunity to purchase the duplex next to me, wrote it into all my kids' leases to where I get the garages. Uh, it was a two-car garage on one, it was a duplex, so two-car garage on one side, one car on the other side. So before I knew it, I had, you know, about four-car garage space worth and got a few storage units and the rest is history. And so, you know, we've really refined the systems and, you know, pick up a lot of different couches that I was picking up or to start off with because I got in some really gnarly couches, you know, that I, we wouldn't touch anymore. Oh, I'm sure. It was a great, I'm sure, great learning experience. Yeah, the free section there on Marketplace is is quite the spot. You just <laughs> you never know what you're going to find, the condition and such. So, but hey, I mean, obviously that proof of concept worked right off the bat. Of I can get this thing here, no money, and and make a few bucks very quickly. And you know, from somebody that I flipped a lot of things back in the day, um, you know, some cars, some electronics, and you know, mis- miscellaneous. Never flip wood slices, uh, definitely uh, not in that realm or or even furniture. But I mean, it's just so cool that you can, you know, there's there's everybody's willing to pay um, a price for something, right? And there's also people that are willing to get rid of things at a discount for the ease of it, for whatever the case may be. And that's where you, you enter in. So how long did you do it as kind of, you know, this is something I'm just going to do to make a few bucks. Let me see what I can get for free. And then when did you realize that, okay, maybe I should look at doing this more consistently and, you know, start spending some money on these? Yeah. Um, I mean, I was a sophomore in college. So, I mean, it it took me, I was, I was very softly doing it for probably eight months. And it was really funny once we had scaled things up about, uh, about 10 months after that, or no, Sorry, junior year. I was doing a junior year. So junior, senior year, and then moving into the program. Um, so 
it was just funny to look back and see that on my whiteboard, I was like, I need to make $800 this month or, you know, whatever it was. And then seeing that in about 15 months, you know, we're, we're doing, let's see, $40,000 a month in total sales. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's been quite a ride. Right. Right. The jump there. Uh, can you break down the the process of, of flipping a couch um, or a piece of furniture as far as where you know where are you buying these? What is are you fixing them up quite a bit? The cleaning, the whatever, and then the sales side. What what does that process for a single transaction look like? Yeah, so I mean, there's there's really only a few variables. You know, what what sort of material you're looking at? You know, what sort of condition are you looking at? And and what are the margins? And it's once you really look at couches because couches specifically are what we do couches and chairs um because it just you know after trying to flip a handful of different things there was just so much demand for the couches but you know um the margins that we have are pretty strict now that we do such volume so we can't pick up a couch unless we're going to make about 400 dollars on it you know that's considering travel taxes and all of that and so it's as simple as um knowing the product and you know there's a lot of expensive brands um we really only go for the expensive stuff now. Uh, we can't. We just can't afford to do the lower end because it's, we just have. You know, I want to say we've got eighty-five unprocessed couches, you know, and so we've we've got a ton of value sitting there and a ton of value that we're going to be able to put back into the market. But really, our number one is to be able to find a couch we can make four hundred dollars on and really not do anything to. You know, if we can, something we specialize in is like refinishing leather on a very mild degree. So we can recolor things to an extent. And so if we can find pretty much any dark brown couch, we can make that look brand new. And so that's an edge that we have that, you know, we're hunting for any torn up leather sectional. And um, I would say that's probably one of our number one products besides, you know, a gray sectional. It's really fascinating because, you know, look at the Springfield market versus the St. Louis market, completely different. Um, no one's looking for not there's not as many people looking for big sectionals up there and so like sets sets do better luxury it's you know it's been really fascinating to see the mm. the differences in the different markets that i wouldn't have expected yeah that is, that is interesting things you might i wouldn't even think about of yeah different pieces of furniture couches selling better in different locations uh for for that timeline and process then on on flipping something how long you know you said you've got like 85 pieces give or take now how long does it take from the moment you find it to the moment it's sold, you know, delivered out? Uh, what What is that timeline? Yeah, I would say we'll turn all of our inventory around in roughly 45 days. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just a constant process of trying to pick up, you know, two to three couches a day in each location to also try and sell two or three at each location. And so, you know, it seems like the guys run all day long and, you know, we've got trucks, trailers, and wouldn't be able to do it without that. Yeah, take take me into the team a little bit. When did you first bring somebody on to helping you with this? Was it part time? Was it full time? And then how did that scale um, to to where it's at? And what was the thought process on bringing these people on at that time? Yeah, and you know when I started it, it was just um, it was just a way to make some extra money. I wasn't intending on dropping out of the program. I wasn't. You know, the program was going well, and I just wasn't crazy about it. And uh, I met one of my great friends at a coffee shop because I was studying a lot for the program. And we got to talking, and he was like, what do you do? I was like, well, I, I go to school, and I'm selling these couches. And he was like, you know, one thing led to another, and he actually ended up moving into the duplex that I was keeping a lot of the furniture at. And he was like, he was like, what is all this? Tell me about it. And so we ended up, you know, becoming great friends, and he was like, uh, I'd love to help you out with this. And so we ended up. I ended up bringing him on because he was like, this, I can make, you know, much more money doing this than working at the coffee shop and, you know, learn a little bit about business. And then it got to the point where we were like, whoa, we both hit, you know, 10 grand this month. This is, this is pretty crazy. Like these are some numbers to think about. And so, you know, because at that point we had, you know, four stalls in a garage and, and one storage unit. And so uh, one thing led to another and I was like, you know, I'm not super crazy about this program. And he was like, you know, I this, you know, pretty much all that I could do right Allie's like it's going great and so we ended up staying in the garages for a little bit and then we uh, really started looking for a warehouse pretty seriously and we found a, a really good price on one in nixa that we're still currently at it's uh 
I think it's like 2,400 square feet, which is a little small for what we need because we still carry a few storage units. Um, we probably have another 800 square feet in storage units for inventory that we have to process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because at this point you've got, you know, some genuine, you know, monthly expenses that are coming out. You know, it's not cheap to, to rent those spaces out, but obviously, you know, that's just all factored into, you know, your net operating income and, you know, just calculating what that's going to be after the income that you do bring in from the, from the, you know, couch sales and, and furniture and such. So it's, it's neat. And I'm curious, is there much competition in this space? Because before I talked to you, I hadn't really heard of people doing this, at least at the scale that you're doing it. Yeah. So, um, I would say as far as like intra-city competition, most people flipping furniture is a season for them. Hey, I'm in college. I don't have much time. I saw some videos, you know, they're going to get a storage unit and, and do some stuff. And we've seen early 15 people come and go in the market. And there's a few strong sellers that have been here for like a multi-year stretch. Um, I've watched, um, it's called Cow House Trading Company. We actually have bought a handful of uh, furniture from them. They actually wholesaled some couches. They wholesaled like 30 couches to us at one point in time. And now they have their own store in Marchfield and they're, they've got a really large operation. Um, but as far as, there's no one that's really kind of uh, where we are in this market. I would say if you go look at Kansas City, there's um there's another seller up there that's that's doing a lot of volume that you know we we frequently talk with and it's it's really enjoyable to get to talk to someone in the space because it is kind of a lonely space you know it's not yeah. it's not like anyone like go do a real estate meetup you know I go into a youth couch, you know, couch meetup you know there's no one to bounce ideas off of so sure. sure but competition definitely three to four low level flippers here in the area mm -hmm. not low level anything to do with their operation but they just don't don't do very much volume yeah and did I I I heard you mention earlier um, St. Louis as well. So are you in the Springfield and the St. Louis market doing the same thing? Yeah. So St. Louis, um, like I said, we didn't really know what we were getting into whenever we opened up the city there. We thought it'd be very similar to Springfield and it really couldn't have been more different. Um, there is just a ridiculous amount of volume up there. Like we can pull about 4x as much volume in inventory from St. Louis as we do in Springfield. And so we end up bringing a lot of the inventory down because we can also get it cheaper up there and then you know the the pricing dynamics is a lot different uh in st louis as well but we've got three guys here in springfield and two guys up in st louis and and uh you know it's it's pretty bare bones operation you know you could go a, a lot more into marketing and um, staging and all those things but we build like a little two wall l to sit behind the couches and that's it the rest of it's just storage and so i I look forward to the day when, you know, when we can take more risk and be able to really legitimize, you know, ourselves as a furniture company. But for now, it's just, it's just really nice to have that simplicity of the model. We've got a few guys, bare bones warehouse and, you know, a bunch of inventory and we don't, we don't do any marketing besides um, posting things on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's, I'm clinging to the simplicity. Right. Right. So. And does some of that come into the, the fact that you would rather not spend as much of your time in there? And in order to, you know, kind of take it to the next level, maybe the, you know, the, some marketing or, you know, the different aspects that you could grow your profit margins by a little bit. Are those just things that you would need to directly spend your time in making more systems, more of a structure? And because you're not in it and this system's working, essentially you're just plugging and playing and it's just it's just going by itself yeah it's it's at a point to where there's there's so much to do with the guys that we have we pretty much maxed out all their time and we feel really good about the numbers that we're putting out so you know it seems like we've been in a season of growth for you know we we haven't even been in the warehouse we've been in springfield for a full year and so uh it'll be a full year next month and so we six months into opening the store in springfield we opened the store in st louis and it's just kind of nice to cruise for a little bit because, you know, I'm, I'm sure what growth load feels like. It's busy and hectic and uncertain. And, and right now it just feels good to, to get in routine and really put in some solid numbers. Right. With, with the, I know you said in St. Louis, it seems to be like four times, you know, uh, the amount of maybe furniture you can find, couches and such. Like, are you, do you feel constrained? Like you've kind of reached the top of, you know, the amount of couches you can buy here in the Springfield market and, you know, or the amount of people that are willing to buy them, or is it more so you're just limited by the crew that you've got and the space that you've got, and you could double it if, 
you know, if those things grew? Yeah. So as far, you know, from the supply side in Springfield, we buy pretty much every couch that we can. Um, St. Louis supplements. So, so there, there's much more demand in the market for used furniture than there is that we have the ability to purchase that comes on the open market. And so, you know, we probably run 50 listings in Springfield at a time. And I would say that number could be double and we wouldn't oversaturate the market, but we're going to have to be getting those couches from somewhere else. And so that's kind of something that we've been trying to navigate, um, you know, looking at getting some semi trucks or things like that, some wholesale couches. Yeah. And you're bringing some of these down from St. Louis, you said. So, like truck and trailer or whatever it is. And it's obviously, even with the gas and the time, still profitable to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, what we can bring back, you know, just, you know, for rough numbers with those margins, roughly maybe $400 a couch, you know, it'll probably cost us like $600 to run a load of inventory uh, down for a day. And so that'll be one of our guys from Springfield, maybe. So we've got, um, a 20 foot trailer and a, a, a big truck and we can probably, we can get like 13 couches on that, which it looks ridiculous or drive it down the state. Uh, but it works. And it, sometimes we'll get, if we want to take an even bigger load, we'll, we'll get the, the large U-Haul that they have and just drive it up there, mm-hmm. pack it to the ceiling. So. Right. Right. No, I, I like it. I think the idea to move into a new market makes a lot of sense just to test that out. And yeah, I mean, why St. Louis, you know, from us, that's three hours away. Um, obviously there's three, four or other cities that maybe you could have done it in. Is there a certain reason there, uh, over another place? Yeah. So it was, um, we were really between Kansas city and St. Louis. We watched, um, we watched about, uh, eight to 10 different markets across, um, you know, the country looking at Denver, Colorado, Houston, Texas, Tulsa, Oklahoma, you know, all of the, the big metropolitan cities. And it, it really seemed like the mission returns for us to put in a lot of effort to put in a store that was 12 hours away that I wasn't going to be able to travel to. So then we kind of narrowed it down to Tulsa, Springfield, or KC. And seeing as I had the opportunity to hire one of the guys that I played baseball with in college to be the manager in St. Louis, it just seemed like a great fit. A warehouse came together quickly. And so we just worked with the flop. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense there. And when it comes to, you know, getting these the pieces of furniture, these couches to flip, you know, it's all about the deal. It's all about seeing value in somebody who has something underlisted um, or, you know, it is in rough conditions. So you're going to put in a little bit of work to fix it up. You know, you're, you're looking for a good deal, um, expecting that return on investment and return on your time. When did you turn over that process to somebody else? Or, do, I mean, do you still look for each of the couches that you buy or if if not and you turn that over to somebody when did that happen and what's the training look like to get somebody prepared to know what to look for and what to pick up yeah so essentially i removed myself from the business and nate my business partner uh stepped into everything that i was doing so three months ago i was the way that we have it set up is we have um we have a, a processor and then we have someone that sources all the furniture and so i was the person that was in charge of sourcing all the furniture doing all the back end things for the business. And, um, you know, with, since Nate had been doing it for six months, he was more than qualified, uh, to step into that role and source the furniture. But it's, um, you know, outside looking in, you're like, you know, I, you know, buying multiple pieces of, of furniture a day, it probably seems daunting, but it's really, you're buying the same pieces, you know, it's, you're, we're selling all the same captures, nothing's really new. And if there's a new one, it, and no one else knows that it's new and you probably can't price it up. You know, it's a, a big issue with the market is a lot of people don't even realize this, the value that they're purchasing. Like if I've got a, a $10,000 sectional, well, it just looks like 11 sectional compared to the other one that's two, you know, for a lot of the used markets. So. Mm. Yeah. But but yeah, Nate stepped right in that role and he's doing phenomenal. Absolutely. And I know you have it stepped into real estate more recently and, and spending your time there. I mean... Before we even jump into that, I know you had mentioned, you know, bringing in, if if I'm correct, about forty thousand a month for this business, and and that's kind of the I would assume maybe the gross profit. Uh, are you what? What's the decision making behind stepping into a new industry versus just continuing what you've already got? You know, this proven system, this model. Um, is it you know just 
the margins margins on there are not what you see and and you know for what your time could be getting elsewhere or or can you tell me the decision making behind you know switching things up and uh you know comparing the two no that's a great question um you know part of it is that it, it is um so rigorous to go out and almost every month be like i have to get all my inventory for the next month and you know not that I think there's any fragility in the market. You know, Facebook's investing a lot into marketplace and the algorithm and, and things like that. I think there's a lot of strength and a lot of demand and there'll be a lot of continued demand for used furniture for a handful of reasons. Um, but it was it was the um, the rhythm of the business. You know, this it's it's a great business and it's uh, couches don't appreciate, you know, and then when I could see that, you know, I could sort of step into something that's a little more longer term that's a solid asset class not something that's kind of on the fringes of you know just being something that you do to make income versus you know a a legitimate asset class with appreciation uh, investors and you know historical data when i could look at those returns and and pretty much predict where it's going to be at uh, in the next 10 years the with with furniture i mean a big issue that we have is sometimes our profiles will get blocked and, you know, then we can't sell things that that's cost us, you know, $15,000 one month because, you know, all of our accounts got blocked. We couldn't sell anything. I was like, man, I was like, what if, you know, for whatever reason, something in the marketplace changes and you can't do this and then you've got all this infrastructure and it's like, you know, for the way that the business is built right now is we are solely dependent on Facebook marketplace yeah. and it's not a bad thing unless things change and, you know, it was just a combination of seeing, uh, seeing the returns in real estate, seeing the the rhythm of real estate, and how you can really lean into it, and uh, it pays off. Um, that being the, the main basis. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a reason I chose it as well, and a lot of it is that of uh, the asset class you're working in, the appreciation, the long term. Look at you know this business that you can be building. Uh, not that what you've built isn't going to be around for a while because I'm, I'm confident it will be as like you're saying Facebook seems to be putting in more and more um, emphasis and you know money on their marketplace and that's the central spot for used you know products um, across the country but there is definitely something to building up real estate and getting into that full time which I can understand I, I did want to ask do you feel like for you building a business finding good deals comes naturally do you feel like that's something you've had to grow quite a bit um, as you got into it? Um, I feel like I didn't even realize that I was training to, you know, deeply understand supply and demand and, and move into business when I started selling wood slices. But looking back, it's like I was, you know, not only like doing wood slices, but it was computers, tables, mirrors, freezers, anything I could get my hands on and just seeing how it performs and, and you know, kind of slowly starting to build that business philosophy without even realizing it. And now... Um, it's, it's kind of what I crave to do, to be honest. You know, I, I crave the systems. I crave the efficiency. I crave, I crave, you know, finding the perfect person to the role and um, watching them just, you know, all their strengths be brought out. And so I would say it was a big learning curve and I've done a lot of things the wrong way to start out with, but it's just, you know, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's, I have so much fun doing what I do. Yeah, yeah. And I know a lot of, you know, especially younger people getting into business or people in general, they have a little bit of this analysis paralysis. They can tend to over-educate and just look at all of the, you know, potential risks, all of the uh, things that could happen if I jumped into this, what's this going to be like bef- without taking the necessary actions just to to do some deals to, to make things happen. What do you think was different on your end? Because it seems like you, you know, tested something, it worked, and you just went again and again and again. Uh, do you take a step back and, you know, get worried sometimes about, Hey, we've got a lot of inventory. What if this doesn't work or, you know, question yourself along the way, or it, was it just one step in front of the other and, and seeing that it's been working? Uh, I would say that catches was, um, a relatively forgiving beginning. Um, but uh, as far as being a risk taker, um, I think some people would see me as, you know, as a risk taker. But I, I don't do anything without, you know, looking at the data. You know, I love data. That's like the first thing I go to before making any decision. And then from there, I optimize. And I wouldn't find the peace in taking on big risks unless I've looked deeply and understand the data. You know, that's 
that's my threshold. And I think, I think just, um, for whatever reason, I've always been really attracted to the data and that for me, um, shuts down any emotional risk that I feel, you know? And so, but, but yeah, definitely. I think a lot of people shy away from the risk and it's, it's a tough hurdle to get over. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's always going to be there though, in any sort of business, any deal that you're doing there, there's going to be an element of risk. There's risk in not doing deals and not, uh, starting your own company and, and such as well. It's just a matter of which you're going to choose, but you mitigate that risk by, like you're saying, looking at data, uh, studying whatever it is that you're going into to make sure, am I well prepared for this? Do I know all the potential outcomes or at least what I can control? And then, yeah, what's the, what's the positive? What, what's the potential outcome? What's the potential loss or negative if it just absolutely didn't turn out? And yeah, it sounds like that's what you've, you've looked into both for the furniture business and then getting into real estate and, and kind of that's helped with your decision-making. Uh, can you, uh, tell us a little bit about what you are currently doing nowadays with real estate, stepping into that, how kind of long that's been, um, of making that your full-time effort and what your goals and plans are for, you know, say the next 12 months on what you're looking to, to do. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a big question. Um, so, uh, uh, probably 13 months ago, I met, uh, my now business partner, Michael Thomas. And, uh, in April we got together and said, let's do this thing. Let's scale it. Let's, let's really dive in and, and, and make a great company. And so that's when Hive was born. Um, fast forward to now and we've got, we've got 20 full-time construction guys and, you know, all the projects that we're working on. It's in Lake's office doing, uh, administrative property management and accounting and um we're currently renovating 34 different units and um, as far as goals for next year just continue to to grow in a bulletproof way and continue to optimize these systems and refine these systems and continue to you know, kind of circling back to the the previous question, something that I did from the beginning of selling furniture is I could show you my list today. Everything that I sold, I had all the data on every single couch from the first couch that I sold, how much I paid for it, how much it sold for, what was the reaction that I got when I listed it. And, you know, I'm just, we're just taking all those principles and using them out. So how much is each, uh, how much did it cost to pay this house? How much did the landscaping, how many hours did the landscaping take? How many did this and this and this? And for, you know, every project that we have, we have all the data, uh, for everything and, and every person in the company. And, you know, then we get to look at that, digest it and optimize it. And, you know, we're just going to continue to, to push forward and try to make great decisions. So it's, uh, I don't know if I can tell you a goal for the next 12 months, but continue to have fun and uh, build a bulletproof business. Absolutely. I mean, you're, you're off to the races already. It sounds like with, you know, that many, uh, you know, staff and, you know, your team there of being able to take down, you know, 34 at a time, as well as, you know, in-house uh, assistant um, and different roles that they're handling there. That's just going to allow you to f- allow your time once again to, to free up and look for the next deal, look for the automation that you can make in the company to move it forward. Uh, I know we, you, we've touched on it some already, but just because you do like looking at the data and calculating things out, why real estate over other in f- forms of investing? Uh, what do you see the value in real estate being for for yourself, for people in general, um, over you know just going a different route, even you know their own business or stocks or whatnot? Uh, for you, what's what's the big pull um, of really doubling down there? It's a great question. Um, you know, it's like I said, the asset class has so many advantages, so many tax advantages, and so much. The predictability, you know, within reason. Um, I mean, having a, a, a great business partner and a great foundation to start with, it's just really, really launched us forward into um, a very seamless entry into some more volume. And so, you know, I've, you know, been really heavily involved with the stock market you now at a few points in my life and seeing the way that other businesses work. I mean, I, if, if, if there's a way that to, to make real estate uh, something that you're investing in and also your business that produces large amount of income, I feel like I would have a hard time arguing that 
you know, unless this some other business is doing a ridiculous amount of revenue that you're not going to be able to find a, a better sweet spot between long-term gain, long-term potential, or long-term return, and then, you know, that, that risk for a file with, you know, how you can offset that with tenants and things like that. Right, right, definitely. Definitely agree there. There's just a lot of benefits that you experience being in real estate that other assets or, you know, other um, aspects in, in different ventures you can go into with investing don't have, uh, you know, like you're, like you're mentioning. I mean, first off, you know, what I like is just that it's a physical product that you can drive up to it, you can see it, um, and it's real in a lot of ways. And this is, this is like you're saying, a piece of property that's appreciating, that's going to be beat out inflation, that's going to be cash flowing in the meantime, that the tenants and whoever is in there is paying down your mortgage, right, to build up more equity in that property, as well as rental rate appreciation and tax incentives. So there's just all of these these benefits. And for you getting into it, is it, I want to create a, you know, and tell me about what you're working on, a team and a, and a crew for flips, and this is our business, and this business is what I'm getting into real estate for, is it long-term rental properties and building a portfolio so that cash flow gets built up there? Is it property management? Is it all of the above? What, what aspect of real estate do you really uh, hone in on or um, are looking for? Um, that's a great question, again, and it's a it's a tough one because you know we we didn't plan on having this big of a construction crew, but after looking at what the subs charge and you know where we it just it's just been the natural first place to optimize if we want to be able to do more volume um to be able to look at look at all those the different metrics and be like wow you know we could 15 grand you know here and there and you know we can get the right crews in place and that's just been the first place that we've optimized and it's just kind of put us in this position um that you know we're really thankful for uh, and i think that's what we're going to continue to do. I'm not sure how much optimization we have in the property management side of things. Um, but yeah, I would say that's that's the main reason. Yeah, makes sense. So with all of these units here, I mean, that's, you know, quite a few to be to be handling at once. Are you doing just a variety of things with those? Some you're flipping, some you're keeping as rentals, or do you have a, a plan for those, what you've got? Yeah, so, I mean, we have a plan with every property going in, you know, what we're going to do with it before we purchase it. Um, but uh, probably a ratio, you know, we're having to sell a lot of them right now with where interest rates are. Um, probably selling 70% of them, 60, 70% of them, mm -hmm. and keeping the rest of them as, you know, a burr. So, yeah. That's something that we really try to heavily stick to because it's, you know, really difficult if you want to be a company and grow and then you've got, you know, $2 million in equity spread out between. 30 different properties that you can't use versus if you had all the equity in one place, you could really do something like this. So that's something that we're really trying heavily to balance and put ourselves in a really good position of our cash. Right. How are you, I mean, obviously, like you had mentioned, interest rates are high in this in this market we're currently in. Uh, how closely do you watch the economy, the real estate market, um, those sorts of figures? And how much does that play a role into the business that you're doing and the decisions you're making with these houses? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, you know, something that I really try to stick to is to be very in touch with reality and not what I think things should be. And I feel like part of that is trying to immerse myself with the time that I have into different economic factors and economic data and, you know, situations that we're in socioeconomically and, and regionally. And so I, I do consider a fair amount of uh, economic data every, every day. And I really, I think that plays a role in, you know, why we feel good about selling as many properties as we do right now. Um, but it's, it's just, um, it's, it's so multifactorial. It's so complicated right now. You know, you've got, you got rates up, strong demand for housing. You've got, you know, there's a ridiculous amount of people that have interest rates below 4%. I mean, 28% or 37% of people don't have a mortgage in America. And so, you know, there's a lot of people that aren't moving. The supply and demand's kind of funky right now. Um, and then, you know, trying to balance the Fed to not raise rates here soon, to not lower rates too soon, because, you know, if, if they lower rates too soon, it's going to heat up the economy. Inflation's going to go back up. Rates are going to go up and you're going to see eight or 9% next year. You know, I'm not, I don't see that happening because I think they're going to keep rates up. But, uh, you know, 
that was kind of a, there's so much going on. <laughs> there is very, a lot of unique factors that almost seem to uh, fight against each other, you know, with, you know, where we're at in the, the supply or the demand being very high. Uh, and, but at the same time, rates being um, high as well. And just how that plays out with the pricing, the pricing is staying relatively high, at least in our Midwest area. Um, although there are some price drops and things that we're seeing. Uh, so it sounds like for you, you, you know, tend to think that rates are going to stay high because the Fed isn't wanting to, is not wanting to fight inflation again, which would likely pop back up and people are going to get hot and active again in the market. Uh, so you, you tend to see this is kind of the new normal for a little bit and you're just settling into that. Let's, let's flip, let's make some money and then we'll keep the ones that make sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I try to build a big cash position in case there's some pain in the short term because right now we're 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 really floating on a fine line between something getting getting out of the head and you know really seeing a, or a decent recession. Um, you know, if if we continue on the pace where we are, you know, you're not going to see unemployment spike too much, and they're going to be able to keep rates high and get inflation down. But as soon as that the unemployment begins to really speed up, you know, we're going to feel it, and you know whether or not we get to that point, I don't know. Uh, you know, I do know that next year is an election year and they usually pad interest rates, you know, lower. So the economy is feeling a little bit better about that. But at the same time, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, we're, we're in a tricky spot. You know, we could, uh, we could hang out where we are and hang out with rates higher and not feel much pain, you know, but if, if the economy speeds up, which, you know, I'm, it's been Every every economist said we've already had a recession, a recession by now. The economy just continued to show strength. Um, but you know, thankfully, with the last report, inflation came down, unemployment went up, and uh, I think I think they're on the right track. You know, the Fed's been burned a lot in the past by re, uh, lowering too quickly, and I don't think that's something that we're going to see this time. Mm. Um, yeah, for for a handful of reasons. Yeah, I mean, the, it's it's tough watching the economy, and knowing you know what might happen, but it does seem that the the can's been kicked down the road enough that a really you know a larger or somewhat you know serious recession and reset seems to be on the horizon you know like you're saying i think if they find this balance which of course they're going to try and do of keeping rates at this certain point you know bringing inflation back down uh watching unemployment uh that we could be fine at least for the short term at least for you know the next year a couple years whatever it is but just the the lower savings that we're seeing Americans have than ever, the continual increased spending in the government, as well as some some bad bets that big banks and these um, hedge funds and others are making, it seems as if it's going to catch up to us at some point, and we're going to have to to kind of pay the price. And it's a matter of now, or is it going to be later? Um, at least that's kind of what I see. But in the meantime, it's this balancing act of just trying to hold it all together and make sure. Uh, the economy stays stays solid, and it seems like you study that a fair amount, and you know that factors into, of course, the decisions you're making day to day. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think we're ever going to regret having a better cash position, you know, especially with you know when you see consumer debt rising as it is, you know, the number of banks getting getting bought under the rug and not really going public with it. You know, there's there's issues, there's liquidity issues. You know, we're beginning to feel those. You know, and um, whether or not we stay on this fine balance or, you know, things kind of sway one way or the other. I'll be really curious to see. Yeah. Um, but either way, I think it's a great time to buy real estate. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. I think you've always the deal, um, regardless of the market you're in. I mean, it, bad markets can be the best times to be in real estate. Um, it's just all, again, about your your position and you guys are valuing that cash, cash position that'll give you options uh, for when those times come. And, you know, not something you have to be worried about, obviously mindful of, but for you all, is there an equity percentage that you feel comfortable having in these properties? Because naturally with real estate and wanting any sort of decent growth, you're going to have to carry a lot of debt, uh, equity positions, and then the cash positions, maybe per property or just at large that help you feel comfortable with the rate you're growing at. Yeah. Um, you know, with, with, um, with all the money coming in, we put five percent in a reserve account. Uh, you know, we do we do some other things. You know, whenever some some buckets are overflowing, we'll put it put more in the reserve account. Um, and you know, thankfully, that's just been steady increase thus far. Uh, no big, no big uh, curveballs coming in. But right. as far as the dollar amount, it really uh, it really depends on the property. Uh, it really depends on 
you know, did did we budget for an HVAC here and then end up um, getting it fixed for a few hundred bucks? And now that is that going to come in the future? You know, we we specifically allocate um, on a property basis. You know, what does the roof look like? You know, what a, and what sort of timeline are we going to have some sort of big repair? Because I felt like there's a handful of them where we we uh, place our offers as if we'll have to replace the HVAC because it's on its last leg and then it ends up working. And so, you know, obviously we're going to put that that money into the reserve account just so there's no surprises there. And kind of the kind of that case by case basis on all the properties to make sure it's covered. And then, mm. you know, with all the, the income coming in to should be a nice absolutely layer on top of that. Yeah. So. Yeah. How do you continue to educate yourself uh, both in the economy at large and, you know, things that you're looking at there, but just for real estate specifically, you know, I know you're wanting to always improve and grow in that, um, to be able to take down more deals, better deals, um, grow your systems. What, how do you educate yourself? Yeah. Uh, principle that I kind of operate by is, um, I don't, I don't read books unless it's timely for the season. Um, and you know, right now I'm really digging into a lot of construction literature and uh, construction, you know, thoughts, principles, you know, really trying to, you know, in six months have a professional construction crew that's just running like a well oiled machine. Um, and so that's kind of what's on the forefront of my mind right now. And that's where I see, you know, the, 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 the most room for optimization in the near term. Um, and then it's kind of hard to look too far in the future because I see that being for the next few months. And then, uh, after that, I'm, I'm not sure what's going to be next, but I'll definitely, definitely pick up some books on the next hurdle. Yeah. And that's something I can definitely admire is just your willingness to look at, Hey, this is what we've got going on right here that we need to really dial in, you know, we're, we're working on these construction crews. I'm going to learn everything I can about how to do that, do that well, um, for, you know, for their benefit, for the business's health and growth. Um, and let's just dial and hammer that in. And then, you know, a year or two from now, we might be doing something a little different, but I'll study and research and, and jump into that more at that time. Uh, it, you know, a lot of people can get ahead of themselves thinking they need to know it all right now or have this super well balanced approach to everything, you know, yes, you want to have an understanding of your industry, but for you, you're in it and now you're just fine tuning some things. So when it comes to, to goals, uh, how, how do you look at goals? Um, do you have, you know, kind of like this is, you know, we talked about it a little bit. sounds like in the immediate term, it's just picking up, you know, good deals and properties and selling some, keeping others that make sense. Do you have like a five year, um, place in mind or even like a long term this is where I want to be at uh with with passive income with properties anything in in those lines I wish I had a number for you but I don't um I've tried to you know think about it and put a number on it <laughs> I remember uh earlier this year cuz you know, I had been doing a little bit of a very small scale investing when I was doing furniture and I was like I want to buy four homes this year and I was like I don't think I can do that I was like, I might could do one or two and to, to, to be where we are. I'm just like, my goodness. So it really puts me in a different frame of mind when thinking for goals, especially when it, I feel like I, uh, I'm going to be a little bit biased if I make a goal on a season of growth. I think I should probably make the goals in a, a season of pay. Yeah. Um, but I don't have a number for you. Hey, nothing wrong with that. I mean, you're, you're putting the work in day to day and, and clearly making it happen. And, and that's something I've have to I have to check with myself because I like to set these goals and you know the one the five the ten the the twenty five year plan but things change uh, just every every quarter every month they change and the market goes up and down and you know the last few years um, you know me being in the business four years now I was able to just buy 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 nearly every property I wanted and burr it because every property cash flowed, rates are low, you know, prices were not very high here in Springfield yet. And so it was much different than, you know, and I can set a goal when that's all just flying and going great versus doing that now when maybe one in every five houses actually is going to cash flow and, you know, things are a little bit tighter. You've got to be willing to adjust and to correct. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to slow you down. It's just you're going to have to look at things differently based off of the economy and, and where it's all at. And it sounds like you do a good job of that, of just taking it as it comes uh, and and then making those adjustments as needed. So it's it's cool to see and neat that, you know, you were in the same market and working in the same, you know, some of the similar situations, but that you guys are doing it differently and, um, you know, taking that approach of 
more comprehensive property management, construction, long-term wholesale. What, what, what does your day-to-day look like? How do you break up your time and, and figure out what is valuable for you to spend on? Yeah. Uh, it seems like, you know, I just keep talking about construction, but that's just been something that I've been uh, a big part in trying to refine systems. It's been part of my role in that. And it seems like there's just so much to be done there. Uh, it's just a, a huge, it's a huge can of worms. Um, I think, you know, a, a decent part of my day is spent, uh, looking at all the projects, making sure everything's on the timelines that we have, making sure I'm pushing the guys, not pushing them too much and, uh, making sure we're having that sort of quality control, visiting the properties and getting feedback with the guys and, you know, developing a relationship with the guys is, is very important and making them recognize that they're, you know, a big part of the operation and that, you know, we care about them. We want that to see them succeed as well. And so a decent chunk of my day is managing people and, um, you know, looking at data on all the properties that we have and properties that we have coming in and, and balancing that with, you know, finances and things like that. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, uh, it seems like every day is different. You know, some days go on a handful of appointments, some days well, no appointments and, you know, a bunch of, bunch of numbers. And then some days, you know, spending a lot of time with properties, a lot of time troubleshooting, you know, it seems like if there's ever any big problem with property, it's going to come up the line to me and then I'm going to have to do a bunch of research to figure out what, what to do with it. So I feel like I end up doing a lot of the, uh, the kind of like, uh, problem solving that no one else wants to do on the construction team. We're like, we don't know what to do. You know, sure. A lot of that comes up the line and cause you know, someone has to make the call. Uh, a lot of, I feel like I, I do a lot of design and, uh, cause you know, we, we try to really do these properties up nicely. And so I feel like I spend a lot of time trying to look for inspiration on what I've seen on my properties and things like that. Um, I, I, I would like to spend more time on, um, our long-term trajectory, but right now, so short, my, this is such a season of short-term optimization. It's really not beneficial for me to look at the long-term, you know, are we buying as many as we need to? Are we moving to slowly or moving too quickly, um, knowing we're kind of in a, a, a good range and really just all of my time is spent on that sort of uh, short-term optimization for these, these next 30 to 60 days. Right. No, I like that. And it seems like you're very intentional with, with what you do and just making sure, hey, this is what we're working on right now. I'm going to do what I can to help out our team, you know, perform the best that they need to uh, and get these systems and such in place, the design, you know, let's make sure the properties we're rehabbing are top quality because when the market's a little bit tighter and there's not as many sales, people are going to want good quality work. They're not just going to buy anything. And and those are the things that move a business forward and keep it growing and improving. Uh, those are those little details that a lot of people can miss just because they're, you know, trying to grow too fast or, you know, they're getting lazy with it. So I can appreciate that for sure. Uh, well, uh, Jason, I wanted to jump into kind of the part of the show where we ask the same four questions um, to to our guest. So the first one being, what is one of the best pieces of advice that you have been given? That's tough. Um I, I thought about this a little bit and I, I can't pick out one, you know, particular data point of advice. It seems like every piece of advice that I think is the best piece of advice was super helpful in that season. And, you know, now it's not super applicable or as much as, you know, having, you know, something answered right now. And so, yeah, kind of on that thrum, you know, some, some timing advice that I pulled from, from a book is, you know, really, uh, matching the right person with the right position. And I really had, um, in, in bringing all these construction guys, I really had an idea for some people and I wasn't looking at their personality. And I really, I learned very quickly to be interviewing for personality, even if they're qualified, you know, not being able to bring them on the team, you know, knowing what strengths they need to have regardless of the experience. Mm. And so. That's good. Yeah. Matching uh, personality with the position. I, I think that is absolutely critical. Like you're saying, they can check a lot of the boxes and other ways for this role, but if they're not going to, yeah, personally be a great fit in, in that spot, then that'll show over time. Uh, number number two, then, what is one of your favorite business books? Uh, definitely Principles by Ray Dalio. Uh, I feel like I can go back to that book at any point in time and um, just pull some some really, really helpful nuggets from there. Uh, just him, him preaching on being in step with reality and it's just, uh, I can't, I can't get enough of that book. I can't get enough of that perspective. It's really 
a lot in my business journey. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely, definitely on the list. I, I got to get that one read. Uh, heard some good things there. Uh, okay. Number three, then what is one character tree you notice that successful people commonly share? Uh, I think open-mindedness, open-mindedness is where I see a lot of the people who are really moving fluidly, fluidly through their industry. They just have a knack for being open-minded and, you know, being able to take on projects and hear anyone out. And I just think that's so important. Hmm. I like that. I like that. Yeah. I mean, you're in the business, you know, when you're in the business world and in investing, you're not inside the normal box of exactly knowing what to expect and the outcome. So you've got to be willing to continue to keep your mind open to new possibilities, new options, new relationships. And that's what's going to help you choose the best route for, for growing this thing that doesn't have a script. You're the one that's writing it and, and putting it into place. So I, I like that open-mindedness. Well, then the fourth simply being, um, where can people connect with you? If uh, people are wanting to reach out, hear a little bit more about what you've got going on, um, property side, even, you know, questions on the furniture business and such, uh, where can they connect? Uh, yeah, I've got a Facebook. It's Jason Gerald. And then um, I'd probably be more responsive to my email. It's jason at hive417.com. So I mean, don't, don't hesitate to reach out about anything. Be happy to help or in any way I can. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jason, this has been a great conversation. I really enjoy hearing about uh, the, the couch flipping furniture business. It's something that I don't I, I don't hear uh, at all, really, uh, people doing, but you've obviously crushed it in that and building systems around it and then transitioning into real estate, which is uh, naturally my favorite uh, industry being, being the place that I'm investing my time. So uh, really excited for what you got going on there and appreciate you um, giving some of your your experience and words of wisdom. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me on today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you all for tuning into this episode of the Growth Circle podcast. If you found value from it, like I did, please leave us a five-star rating review and we will catch you on the next one. Thanks.